love to start a podcast laughing. That just means we are having so much fun, Mark Clifton. Mark Clifton, our audience will not know this unless we tell them. This yes. is take number five of this five. podcast. And when, when, you put two men who's, when you put two men whose combined age is about 150 and you <laughs> we try to use technology, it's not a pretty sight. <laughs> Is not a pretty sight. Have you ever well, watched your Have you ever watched your parents or your grandparents try to check their email on your on your uh, television? You know when they're trying to and, and using the remote to try to get into their email. That's kind of what we look like. We're a couple old guys who, yeah. So and Amy's over here doing the best she can with us. But um, yes. this is take five actually. So we should have it down by now. I remember what I said for the first seven minutes, but that's as far as we've gotten. If if we get to 10 minutes on this one, I'm going to go have a drink of Diet Coke <laughs> as, quickly, as quickly as I can. Well, right. the, the topic is really fun. And, Mark, I may say some things you've heard in the last five episodes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to act surprised like I haven't heard him before. <laughs> oh my goodness. But we're the, the topic is why smaller churches are making a comeback. Uh, I want to note a research project. We'll put uh, my article on it in the show notes. The, the research project was done by Stark and three other researchers, very credible researchers, reported in the Wall Street Journal. Then I summarized it at uh, Rainer on, at, uh, at uh, churchanswers.com. And it's essentially this. Let me let me give you some of the highlights of it. Not essentially. Most of the religious census surveys indicate that there are about 344,000 churches in the United States. Their research indicates it's closer to 500,000. Mark, what wow. happened to all around 150,000 churches in the United States? Why would they miscount, not count 150,000? What, what would be the cause of – that's like – 40% or uh, it's a big number. That's all I know. It is. It, it is. It is a big number. And look, we, we're messing up with technology enough. Don't start doing math. We'll really get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but it, yes, let's, let's, let's talk like two old guys. That's a big number. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a big number out there. I'll tell you what. <laughs> it is. They're, they're missing a lot of churches and pro they're saying, they're, they're saying this, the religious census information is missing as many as 150,000. Why? Probably because they don't have websites and maybe because they don't have church in the name because these algorithms oftentimes will be trying to pull information that says, is that a church? Well, if it's, if it, if it says Bethel House of Worship, it may not be counted as a church. If it doesn't have a website, they may not know it's there. And, and Mark, what they did, they didn't do a massive amount of study, but they went on the field and they went to three counties and basically hand counted churches, went around and hand counted churches. And they said that the religious census count missed as many as 40 percent of churches in those three. counties. Wow. So, so there are a lot more churches out there than we thought. And yes. there are a lot more small churches out there than we had thought. Right. Because yes. they're not missing the big mega churches. They're missing those small neighborhood community churches. Um, and, you know, I'm Southern Baptist. If I mentioned that uh, lately, but I am Southern Baptist, you know, and uh, it I is the that. largest Protestant denomination in the world. And as you have so rightfully said, it, it, it about half you, you you explain it better than I do. The media. <laughs> no, I did. Sorry. Now, in the fourth podcast, I really messed up, <laughs> but I think I got it right in the other. Okay, there, 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 somewhere there's around forty-five to fifty thousand Southern Baptist churches, largest Protestant denomination in the world. So they're somewhere between forty-five and fifty thousand churches. Of those churches, fifty percent have a worship attendance under sixty. That was really easy. Right. The way I said that, fifty percent of Southern Baptist churches have a worship attendance under 60. And I think Southern Baptists are, are pretty indicative of all Protestant denominations. I don't think, I think that would be probably similar of all of them in many ways. So in size, uh, definitely. Yeah, Southern Baptists have I, I just think we, we're they totally unaware of nothing like other denominations. So, but inside, <laughs> yes. 
I, I just think sometimes we're totally unaware of how many small churches there are. I'm doing a lot of stuff with rural work right now. Yeah. And, um, I, you realize that 75% of, ever, of all communities in the United States have less than 5,000 people in them. Wow. Well, so, I mean, there's just so many small towns, so many small villages, so many small churches. And I think sometimes we just overlook them and we don't see them. But I think there's a huge emphasis and movement toward everything smaller and smaller churches included. Yeah, let's talk about some of the reasons why. One of the obvious reasons is COVID. Uh, COVID really exacerbated the importance of the community and the neighborhood. Mark, I got to know more neighbors during the quarantine than any time in my 15 years living in my neighborhood. Yeah, we did too. I talked to my neighbors more. We were all home all day (laughs) and and outside and we'd talk over the fence or from backyard to backyard. And yeah, I got to know my neighbors a lot more and I got to know my neighborhood a lot more and my community a lot more than I ever did before Um, because I wasn't driving any place, wasn't going any place. I would walk in the neighborhood just to get out of the house. I didn't care if I saw people or not in an introverted way, but I did. There were a lot of people with the same thing I did. I not only got to know neighbors, I not only got to know my neighborhood, I learned the history of the land that we're on. People would say, do you know where this land is? And they'd they'd tell us about the Indians that were there well before any Anglos came in and and what they represented. And and, And I said, well, you know that vacant lot, and we have one vacant lot in our neighborhood, and people sometimes say, why didn't they build on that lot? It's the Indian burial ground. And and so I, I learned a lot about it. But the point is, COVID reintroduced us to the neighborhood. And that means that the neighborhood church has taken on more importance. And it means that um, those things that are smaller are not necessarily negative. So the smaller church, in many ways, Mark, got a boost during the, the uh, not just uh, COVID, but specifically the pandemic and the quarantine of COVID. What I what I experienced in my work is this, that coming out of COVID, community means a lot more to people than it did prior to COVID. Um, one of the reasons people went to large churches and by their own admission was I can get lost there. Or I can be involved if I want to be involved. And then if I want to take some time off and not be involved, nobody really knows, you know, there's some anonymity in a larger church. Right. If I go to a church of 30 people, they're going to know if I'm there week to week. But when we all were shut down from COVID and couldn't get together and couldn't be in community, couldn't even be with our own parents and, and, and grandchildren, all of a sudden we craved community. And so in some ways, the things we were sort of avoiding in a large church, we now want. And maybe in some ways, not always, but we can find that better almost easier let's just say less complicated that's a better way of putting it in a small church than in a large you can find it in a large church but it's a little more difficult to navigate to find that kind of community but you walk into a church like i pastor every sunday of less than 60 75 people i mean the first sunday you're there by talks to you and second sunday you're there you're one of us i mean it's, it's that tight community and people who are looking for community find that very very meaningful uh, second related to this, during during the quarantine of the pandemic, uh, we started getting accustomed to digital tools, to video and audio tools. Uh, it was during this period where Zoom became a both a noun and a verb for most of the, most of the world. Hey, are we going to Zoom today? Are we going to be on Zoom? And I know that there there are other means of communication. I just had a meeting with a something other than Zoom, and I had to figure out which buttons to push because I'm 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 always on Zoom, but these digital tools allowed us to be in one place and work in another. And that was a new reality, not having to commute and to go into the, into work. I live in the Nashville area, I specifically live in Franklin, Tennessee, which is south of Nashville, the greater uh, Nashville area. We are a boom town. Uh, we, we actually have a construction crane watch on video. How I many construction cranes are, 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 are in, in Nashville? So we're a boom town. But something amazing has happened. I'm going to give you one example, not try to bore people with this because there are many of them. Amazon has come to Nashville with full force. I mean, distribution centers all over the place, but now they're, they're employing five and soon 10,000 people in downtown Nashville. They built one tower 
okay, pre-pandemic, after they started occupying them. They built the second tower. They stopped building it. They're going to build the shell, but they're not going to build out the inside at all because so many of their workers are not coming into the office. So the second tower is only going to be a shell for the near term. So that's wow. an example of the, they're hiring the same number of people. They're going to be hire close to 10,000 in downtown Nashville or presumably where they would have been in downtown Nashville. But now they're working from home. So right. all this all this construction that's going on is beginning to slow down because people want to work from home or other places that are more convenient, not the not travel and commute. And what does that mean? They're less likely to desire to commute 30, 45, 60 minutes to a church on Sunday. They want to go closer. That's a long explanation, but the Amazon story has been amazing to me. Well, I, you're right. And, and one of the many things COVID did, it forced technology, even though you and I can't, I can't figure it out. It forced, it forced us to be able to. It's usually me. I'm just enjoying it. It forced us to be able to. I enjoyed your frustration, Mark. I'm, inter- I'm talking over you. I'm sorry. But I was trying not to chuckle because you were really getting frustrated with that box or whatever it is. I'm sorry. What are you, <laughs> but, what are you saying? But anyway. <laughs> I know, I know, but but technology to COVID did take some some leaps. People got more comfortable with it. Uh, Zoom conferences and and so working remotely obviously was a necessity during COVID, and now people like it. They don't like having to commute through heavy traffic, hour and a half every day. Uh, they like being able to be home and do those things, and so that has caused us to again look smaller rather than larger. And what is in my immediate neighborhood? What's in my immediate area? All those things bode well for the neighborhood church, which if you've heard me talk over the last 10 years, that's been something we really lost, I think, was the emphasis on the neighborhood church. Everything was sort of regional and large. And really, we just need to get back to the neighborhood church. So, yes, coming out of COVID, for all the reasons you just said, it's another reason that I think the small church is coming into its own perhaps more now than before. Another reason is demographic largest generation before the millennials were the baby boomers. Uh, 76.1 million baby boomers were born between 1946 and 1964, including Mark Clifton and Tom Rayner. And then you put in uh, Gen X, which include Sam Rayner. No, Sam's a, Sam's the oldest millennial. It definitely include Amy Jordan and some of our and, and some of our other team members. But Gen X and the baby boomers combined wanted the big event. There's reasons behind it. They wanted the big stadiums for the athletic event. They wanted the big venue for the music or concert event. And they wanted the big thing also in church. They wanted the show. They wanted the big event. And as you have indicated, they wanted the anonymity. Millennials and Gen Z, not so much. And that's favoring the smaller church as well. Yeah, I agree. And again, Millennials don't even like the big box stores, do they? That's um, you know, a good I, point. I have, I have a, I have mostly millennials on the team that I lead at the North American Mission Board, and whenever we go out and eat, uh, I always want to go to a well-known place that's a big place that is a chain, Cracker Barrel or Bob Evans. Those are two. <laughs> and they're, of, those they're, they're always, well, they're always looking for these little, they're always looking for these little foodie places, right? These little tiny foodie places out of the way that nobody knows about that. You got to, got to stand in line to get there. It's all crammed in there. I don't understand the menu. It doesn't make any sense to me. And it's really expensive. And they just think it's the greatest thing in the world. I'm thinking I could be at Cracker Barrel right now eating like breakfast food at seven o'clock at night. That's where I want to go. But they, they don't want big things. They don't want things that look, you know, homogenized. They like the unique small things. And I do think that that has bode very well for the, the neighborhood community, smaller church. I think millennials see the value in that, that perhaps my generation didn't. We kind of liked everything to be the same. Large is always better, all that kind of stuff. You know, episode 263 could be about the smaller church. But it could be about two old fogies that just don't like things the way they used to, the way they are. We want things to change. I love my Cracker Barrel too, Mark. I mean, that <laughs> that that to me is, and it's my wife's favorite place to eat too. So you know, there. Yeah. I want my go. breakfast. She wants her vegetables, and 
we're, we're there you go. vegetables soaked in lots of grease. We understand that, but it's still vegetables. Vegetables are vegetables. So this has been a generational issue as, as well. And let's just make this statement. Bigger is not always better. Uh, we, we sometimes have come to the conclusion that a church of 3,000 is better than a church of 30. And that just is not the case. Now, we're not saying bigger is bad, but we're not saying bigger is better as well. There's too alliterative in that. I got to get away from the bees. But uh, Mark, there are a lot of healthy, effective small churches. As a matter of fact, you are co-vocational and you are leading a small, effective church in yeah, I mean, I really, it's true. The church that we, that I lead has about 30 members, about 65 or 70 attenders. So, uh, uh attending totally. So we have twice as many people attending as, as we have members, uh, just folks in the community, folks checking us out, folks who haven't been in church a long time. And even in a church that size, every week, uh, there's somebody whose life is being touched, who we baptized two people Sunday morning. They were grandchildren of one of our one of our members. He was so pleased to see them there. And they had a dinner afterward for for their family. Um, I could just go on and on. There's something happening all the time. I mean, look, from the outside, you look at that and you go, that's a little church of 50, 60 people. But when you're in it, you're really connecting the people's lives and not just those 50 or 60 but they have children and grandchildren and neighbors and coworkers, and you're able to connect to those and those. And so your your ministry footprint, a church our size, our ministry put footprint is hundreds of people. And it's just exciting to see how God can use that. And then you multiply that by, you know, 400,000 churches across North America. That's a powerful, powerful footprint if we think about it in that way. It, it's the sheer numbers of churches that are in every community, every crossroads, every neighborhood, if they really became places that, that made disciples and, and sought to make their community knows to be better, uh, man, it, it could be a game changer. But so many times, as you've heard me say before, the small church feels like, well, we can't do anything. We just have to let the big churches do it. And uh, and you can do it. You can do a whole lot. I We, we don't have, our church didn't have a, uh, a back to school giveaway. We, we, we couldn't organize something that big. But on our little Facebook community Facebook page, our town's 400 people, right? And we have this little community Facebook page. I just put on there, you know, I'm not sure we can do everything, but we're going to do everything we can. So if you need school supplies this year, if you have a real need, uh, message us on our website and let us know of your need. And, and Tom, we've had six families who messaged us and they were families who had serious needs. They had multiple children. They really couldn't afford their school supplies and some clothes. Mm. So our, our church took the money and, and some of our members, we would meet those people at Walmart or Kohl's or wherever and we would actually shop with them. And it wasn't just like passing something out, right? And we got to know them and got to engage with them and shopped with them. And it was a wonderful experience on, you would call that a small scale, you know, six families. I mean, there are some churches that hand out thousands of school supplies, all right? But we helped six families right in our town of 400, and we did it in a really hands-on kind of way. And you know who really likes that kind of thing? Millennials like that kind of yep. thing. They, they really do. So that's another reason millennials are drawn to small And Gen churches. Z will increasingly do so as well. I am in the church, um, two churches, but uh, most of the time in the Nashville area where son Jess is a pastor. And maybe I love the church to some degree because he's my pastor, but I think there are other reasons. It is not a small church. It, it would be a mid-sized church averaging about 180 in worship attendance, a church that he started in his living room. But I absolutely love it. And I, I turn down invitations to go anywhere on Sunday because I want to be at my church. I don't want to be gone every Sunday. I'm, you know, I, I like this little book somebody wrote called I Am a Church Member, and I want to act like I am a church member. And so I, I, I show up all the time. I also, believe it or not, Mark, lead a community group. It meets on Sunday morning right before the first worship service. Kind of feels like Sunday school, but I'm, we, you know, we just call it a community group. And it, it meets <laughs> in the only available room that we can meet on campus on Sunday. And um, it's cross generational. We don't have child care because we meet at eight before the services begin. It's cross generational. Well, a young lady joined our group, and she's been just an incredible addition. We're, we're cross generational. Um, I'm the oldest, but she's now the youngest. I think she's 19 years old. And and she came into the group and she's just added so much. We went through my 
Uh, I got a new book out, Mark, and they just send it to you called Sharing the Gospel with Ease. I got, I got, to, I got to send that to you. Amy can put it in the show notes. Uh, someone asked if we could go through my book um, so for seven weeks, eight weeks, however many chapters there were. So we did. And she started talking about all this 19 year old lady, young lady, started talking about all her witnessing experiences and, and what she was doing. As she said, I read this book and now I'm going to do this. And I've, I've been able to share gospel with this person, this person. I'm thinking about, man, the impact of small church. I told Jess, I said, did you know that? Uh, and I gave her name is uh, in our community group. He said, I saw her going in there, surprised. And uh, he said, you know, Dad, she just walked into the service about a year ago, and I led her to Christ. And I'm thinking, okay, young lady walks into a church, talks to the pastor, becomes a follower of Christ, joins an old fogey teaching community group, and is now sharing the gospel all over the place. That is not, uh, we're not a large church, but boy, our Right. Is God using a lot of people in the church? It's awesome. Love those stories. And I hope these stories encourage guys who pastor churches that are not large churches. Um, because I really do think it is it is the time of the smaller church. I think you're right. There's all kinds of signs that that's coming and that is already arriving. And, uh, and coming out of COVID was one. Native community is another. Millennials is another. All those kinds of well, things. Well, essentially what we're do you have another one, Tom? I'm, I'm going to wrap it up with two. Uh, we, we, we've, got, we've got to make the clear statement that bigger is not always better. Bigger is not bad, That's true. but bigger is not always better. And now we're learning that. And then the last thing I want to bring up is the multi-movement. Um, through church adoption you, or replanting, whatever terminology you use, there are more churches out there that aren't getting counted that's another reason why, Mark, uh, that uh, they're, they're not really counting all the multi-site campuses. And most of those sites are smaller, and they are adding to the smaller church movement. All of this multi-movement, not just the multi-service, but the multi-site, the multi-venue, church replanning, church adoption, that's creating a lot of healthy small churches. Absolutely. We we have such an emphasis now on, on not allowing churches to die. In other words, to, to run toward dying churches and to find pathways for them to live again, where in the past we would have just said, well, their time is up and they're gone, uh, but not anymore. And uh, again, just speaking in my own team, uh, in 2022, we, we've been able to identify well over 100 already this year, Southern Baptist churches that would have closed their doors, but now have taken a replant pathway. And these aren't churches. When we say take a replant pathway, we're not saying you're going to become a big church. You're going to become a, 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 a regional church. We're saying you're going to reach that neighborhood you're in. And we're saying, you know, you're going to if you grow from eight people in gather worship to 75 people That's in gather correct. worship, there's an amazing amount of work you can do with 75 people in gathered Absolutely. worship. And the idea that we're not always shooting for 400 or 500 anymore, at least in, in my team, and we're seeing the success rate going way up because it's more realistic, Dr. Rayner. There's a more realistic goal now of what it means to be a healthy church. If the goal is always being over 500, then you and I both know a really small percentage of churches are ever going to be over 500. But there's more and more. The model is just like I did at Linwood, like I just told you about at Little Linwood, where we are great things can happen among a group of 65, 75, 80 people. And we're seeing value in those churches where in the past we might have turned our back and said, hey, we got to go plant some big ones. Now we're saying, you know what, there's value in these normal sized churches because there's so many of them out there. Well, as we close this particular episode, finally, now, of course, we, we, <laughs> we've been working on this. <laughs> That's what they're yes, saying, too, by the way. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is five times for us as we, as, as we close this episode. I just want to tell you smaller church pastors that you and your ministry are valuable. You are doing an incredible work for the kingdom and don't let anyone dissuade you. Otherwise, you know what? There is a young lady in my community group named Emma that walked into our church who was led to Christ and now is reaching people with the gospel. There are those Emma's in your church who are doing just the same. They're making a difference in the community. The small church is making a comeback, but it never went away. And we want to salute you pastors. We want to salute you church members and staff who are part of these small churches. Hey, continue to come back to Revitalize and Replant. 
Mark and I will eh, we'll try to get our act together, but we'll never fully have it together because we're decrepit and we're old. But we'll, we'll, we'll continue to do so, and we'll continue to talk about things such as the smaller church and what God is doing as he continues to revitalize and replant churches across North America. We'll see you in the next episode. <laughs>